Uh, hello, welcome to the quad. Won't you lend Hawk your lungs to me? Podcast. My heart collapsing. Plant my feet and bitterly breathe up the time that's past. Breath I'll take and breath I'll give. Pray the day's not poised. Stand among the ones that live in lonely indecision. Welcome to the Crackpot Podcast. Good afternoon, James. Hey, well. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you there on the left coast. Yeah, first podcast of 2019. Did you do anything fun for New Year's? No, not at all. I made a point not to. Good, neither did I. All right, we have a few items to cover today. One, uh, <laughs> one topic that you are an expert on that newer listeners or readers might not be aware of is it is that you were in the grocery business. You retired about almost exactly a year ago. Yeah. So that used to be like a big thing we had in common because you would, you know, we'd both spend all our time outside of the house is only to the grocery store. <laughs> you don't go much to the grocery store anymore. Um, however, I wanted to ask you some observations that my mom and I had especially over the holiday shopping period. And um, the kids are home and very active right now. Right. So I apologize for that. So, uh, okay, well, one thing I wanted to ask you is that I have noticed in my local shopping uh, grocery stores that I visit, I have noticed that the carts are getting smaller the carts are replaced more frequently than appears to be necessary to me. And I've even now spotted at Safeway carts where the, no uh, kid kid seats, no no little holes for the kids' legs to, to go through the front. And that kind of shocked me. I don't like actually avoid using those carts. So can you tell us about the shopping cart uh, life cycle? Oh, uh, shopping carts cost a lot of money. You know, they start around $200 a piece, and they go up from there. Uh, just about everybody's fade just out the plastic carts because they're kept near the store, and you could use a lighter and start a huge petrol fire with this rack of carts right underneath the canopy of the supermarket. So, uh, you know, your insurance companies don't want you to have those things. That's probably <coughs> what's going on with removing this seat for the children in the front uh, because it requires a rudimentary level of parental supervision. In fact, where there are some there are some chains in the area I live in where they actually have little cozy keep carts that you'll have carts that the kids will ride in that are like toy carts. There's also the the tiny customer and training cart that the toddler will push around which is a little bit safer than them just walking around because having toddlers walk around in a store is dangerous because they could get hit in the face by another shopping cart because they're lower than the displays. So the little customer and training shopping cart has the flag five feet above it so people can see that something's coming. Uh, the safest thing to do if you have uh, a toddler is to put them in the body of the cart anyhow and to keep them out of trouble, I put them in charge of inventorying the stuff. I just give it to Emma and she decides where it goes in her cart. That's her own little space. It's a good alternative to putting them in that seat. It's dangerous for you to leave them in that seat if there's not a bunch of groceries in the front of the cart because their little, bre their little legs could snap off if the cart tilted back. It, that would All the weight of the cart would land on their legs. And that's about a three-foot fall, a little bit more than three feet. So that, that's certainly a liability thing. In supermarkets, the carts are going to now start getting smaller because the big carts now go to the places like Costco. That's where people are going to purchase a huge amount of stuff. And so many people are doing that that the supermarkets are beginning to think like a convenience store. And the idea of the supermarket, it's not totally dead. I've been in some of them that are still successful, but... A traditional supermarket that tries to give you everything at a fairly reasonable price, but nothing at a great price. 
that's harder and harder to maintain. You've got to be in an upper middle class zone to do that. Working class zones, uh, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, we're in a Silicon Valley suburb area, and it's definitely middle class at least, probably, I would say. Um, and the working class neighbor, the place I shop at when I stay with, uh, when I'm in Baltimore County and I stay with Megan and Nikki and uh, Emma, the place we shop at is a small supermarket that doesn't do high volume. And most of the carts that are used there are the carts that most of my customers like when I was to get a grocer, which is the double decker cart. And it's a little stand up thing. It's got two different trays, one on the bottom, one on the top. And if you load up the bottom and the top, a person could, you know, if the person doesn't have any physical problems, they can carry all of that stuff home. That they're like only maybe 18 inches away from you that from the front to back. And they've right. got two baskets, almost like two carry baskets. Yeah. It's really good for people who walk to a supermarket. That's becoming popular too, because when supermarkets can survive now, it's because they've got reliable walk-in traffic because they can't compete with the, uh, the club stores and, and the Walmarts, even target targets got a ridiculous amount of groceries. That, that's where I bought the Christmas hand this year. Yes, our targets have pretty much a full-size grocery store, uh, just um, like a Walmart, but just the whole scale is smaller, but kind of half groceries and half everything else. I went into a Target one time about, oh, I don't know, maybe about six years ago with a lady friend of mine. She was buying stuff, and I was getting off work. I still had my my black Skechers and my black work shoes and my my white dress shirt and my black tie on from managing the, the ghetto grocery store. So I was up by the registers and they had all these candy racks and I started checking the dates and I used the last register to throw all the out of date stuff on. I actually filled up the entire last register top and the employees were looking at the entire <laughs> hall. They thought I was, she was scandalized when she came up front. She's like, Oh my God, what are you doing? So don't worry. They think I'm the DM. <laughs> So, or some kind of mercenary, mercenary manager come to inspect or something. <laughs> I, I was thinking that it may be because I live in bug world here that there are more people without any children. So they're making these carts with no uh, little toddler seat in the front. That could be, it could be cheaper not to put that piece in. Uh, that's usually when you're racking up carts, which is how I started in the business. Usually where a shopping cart malfunctions is with that piece right there. And it cuts down the life of it, how long you can use it. So that's probably part of the calculation. Yeah. Yeah. The straps get tangled up and everything kind of gets jammed. I've had, I've seen that many times. Yeah. And I do try to put even my big, my older daughter in the bucket of the cart just because it's too wild, you know, especially in the parking lot and everything. I just want to get everybody safely (laughs) back to the car. So, and I had my older daughter take a, leap out of the toddler seat when she was when I was extremely pregnant with my next daughter so she was around two two and three months or so and she just jumped out onto the concrete floor and luckily she landed kind of spread out did not hurt herself but she's she's that wild kind of kid that does that so be careful out there (laughs) when I put Emma in the body of the car when we get to the register she stands up and she heaves the groceries onto the belt like she's some uh, stevedore from 100 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we do that also. Uh, next topic, James, there's a video. I I sent you the link, but you were unable to reach the link. But through the magic of uh, Skype, I have been able to share this video with you. So this is from the New York Post. The headline is Chaos on Subway Platform as Cop Fights Off Hostile Vagrants. Dated December 24th, 2018. So I'm going to share the screen with you again and play this video. So maybe you can narrate the action and tell me when to pause. I'll include this video on the YouTube presentation so hopefully you'll see what we're seeing here okay the way he's bouncing on his feet you can tell he's a kickboxer this guy's at least done a lot of sparring as a kickboxer 
He drops one guy with a back leg front kick. He drops this other bastard with a back leg front kick. He's kicking him in the hips, which is just knocking him down. Now he's cracked this guy, the, the tough Asian looking guy. He's cracked him a couple of times with his baton, which is not a good weapon. He's using it properly as a backup threat. He's carrying his lead arm kind of low in a head to potentially check somebody. There's a couple of good Samaritans trying. Oh, he stiff arms this one asshole into the subway track well which is great. And then he hits this other guy with a stick that tries to close on him. So there's two good Samaritans there. One little guy that, in a tan jacket that's trying to block the crowd from attacking the cop. And then there's uh, the guy that looks like Tommy Sotomayor in a tan jacket that actually successfully held these guys back for a while. And the cop's like, no, let him go. Uh, so I think this guy did an excellent job. That's the best way to use uh, an ass baton. It doesn't survive that many good hits. So you just use it to keep them from closing with you. And this guy used the best self-defense kick that a tall man can use. It was a back leg front kick to the hip. Uh, most people just are not going to stand up to that. A taller, stronger guy. Uh, and this guy was. He was physically superior to all these guys he was dealing with. He looked like he was about 6'2", 180, the guy that was uh, throwing. He his build pretty similar to a couple guys I'm working with right now. Good, Good job. Good job to the cop. The big danger there is that one of these guys gets his gun. And that's really the whole problem with, you know, if he was a chick, you know, if this was a five foot two inch, uh, dump a rama, babe cop, uh, they'd have just had her gun and weapons and everything. And a lot of male cops wouldn't have done very well here too. So as far as cops go that are going to be in a position to have to deal with a crowd of vagrants like that, you need this kind of like, you know, kickboxer type cop. Or you need the Samoan throw your ass around and drop you on your head kind of concrete football player cop to, to control a crowd. The little cop that's not very athletic, he needs a partner or he needs to start shooting people. And then that's going to get him hung. So it looks like this guy was really correctly selected for his job. My little bit of time I spent in New York, the, most of the cops are in groups of five. They're heavily armed. They're very arrogant and big. And then most of the vagrants are in groups of five to 15. So I suppose it could be a problem if one cop ends up out on his own. I don't know how that happened. But he did a, a great job. And it's an excellent self-defense. Uh, it was ruined by the fact that a subway train did not come speeding by <laughs> after that. Uh, when it, you know, we can't have everything. You can't. Can't have everything. It was good, though. I I like the two good Samaritans, two different guys in tan jackets. But I, I just was amazed at how fragile the vagrants looked. Maybe the cop just made it look easy, but they looked like they were just sort of lumbering towards him. And Two of them were dangerous. The first guy he dropped was not dangerous. The second guy he dropped got back up. Yeah. He had to hit him in the head twice with the baton and then stiff arm him to get him back again. And then the last guy that he stiff armed into the stairwell, he was potentially dangerous. If he, if this guy didn't have the skills he did, that guy might have took him down into that trench, concrete trench where the train goes. The guy in the blue that came in on him looked like he was ready to push the cop down there too. And then the cop hit him with a baton and the guy backed up. So of those five guys, three of them were actually dangerous. The other two just got in the way and made it harder for the three that were a little bit more dangerous. That would have been a very dangerous thing for for most unarmed guys. Uh, yeah. To do. So what if they were carrying other weapons of their own? So that guy, the cop already had the baton in his hand, which would make it harder to deploy his gun if he needed it. So he was also kind of taking a risk that the vagrants weren't better armed either well that's the conundrum with this if he uses his gun he loses his job okay so the gun now in the the world of chuck norris rule the gun can only come out after they've already shot at you if you're a cop now in new york uh, my couple of trips in new york it's a science fiction police state uh, big arrogant heavily armed cops all over the place i saw more brand new cop suvs in two minutes in new york city uh, this past fall than I would see in Baltimore for a year. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just ridiculous. They, they're heavily armed. they got a lot of equipment. And uh, the cities they've done a really good job of disarming the city. Okay, so the chances that the guy's going to have a weapon in a place like that, especially in the subways where it's heavily policed, it's not going to be that great. 
And now about those, that subway shoot where the, the tracks are, where the train goes through, I talked to guys that went into those things before when they were kids. And they said that once that train comes, there's nowhere to hide because there is, there's this hollow concrete space on the side of the tracks that people had fallen in would try to roll into. But that's where these iron bars stick out from underneath the train to make contact with the electrical elements on the side. So what looks like it's a safe place, if you would roll into that, you would just get chewed up by these iron bars going 60 miles an hour and electrocuted at the same time. It's really, there's nothing that's more of a horror show than getting thrown down in one of those. And one of these guys at least tried to put that cop down. A push is something that a, a drunk idiot can pull off. Pushing is a primitive cat tactic. It's the primary tactic used by criminal women when they attack normal women, is they just push them down and then they kick them. And most people push down easily. But you can see this guy had his knees bent. He's bounced around on his uh, on the balls of his feet. Not up in the air, but he, he was doing a flex bounce on the balls of his feet. Uh, so he wasn't going to be pushed around easily. So excellent job. Okay, I want to ask you about Baltimore because uh, the murder bowl has concluded and the... Final official tally for Baltimore was 307. Is that right? Well, that's right, and it's not right. Uh, because <laughs> uh, I know for a fact that five murders were taken off after they were put up as a list. They were recategorized as something else. And then this is a homicide, and it gets recategorized as something else. Uh, so uh, that's five. And I also ran into a Baltimore City police officer who pretty much threatened to kill me if I wrote about it, but I did anyhow. I ran into him at a bar in a small town in Pennsylvania where these guys run and hide after they get done, you know, working in the nightmare of Baltimore City. He said that they go out of their way not to list somebody who dies in the hospital due to a shooting as a homicide. Sometimes they get listed, sometimes they don't. Everybody that's found dead on the street pretty much gets listed, but the ones that die in the hospital... They're looking for another way to explain it. And it's not listed as a murder. And this is no surprise because, you know, what last year there was a 26%, supposedly a 26% increase in murders and only a 5% increase in, uh, in other violent crimes. Well, that's just because the other violent crimes are all being recategorized. For instance, the Baltimore City Police Department in Baltimore County will never list anything as a home invasion. They won't even put that out there. You can't get home. It's a burglary now. It's like it's now Bilbo Baggins sneaking into the dragon's lair to get a uh, to get a ring or a golden cup or something. It's no longer some goon coming in and putting a gun to your head and saying, "Give me all your shit." <laughs> so. Okay. Well, we had a comment on a YouTube video, like an older video, asking about Detective Suter, and this was a police detective that was shot. And then died in the hospital. So, <laughs> well, that was ruled a suicide right. eventually. Yeah, so that got acted from the murder camp. So that was okay. in 2017. But come on, That's they're saying 2017's murder camp went from two went from 343 to 342 because they re-ruled Suter as a suicide, even though there was at least one witness who was a police officer who saw a African American man in a hooded sweatshirt pull Suter's gun out from underneath his jacket and shoot him in the head in a green space between two houses. A green space between houses is a place in Baltimore where a house has collapsed or has been burned, and it was a row house. So you now have incomplete rows of row houses in Baltimore. Sometimes there will be a half-acre grassy lot that's only got one row house left in it out of four rows of row houses. So this was this is what a green space is. In, in that Harlem Park neighborhood. He was definitely killed by somebody, but they wrote it a suicide. I don't know. Maybe they had a, a remote viewer uh, sign an affidavit that, you know, that somehow they went back in time and, and discovered that Suter said, please, brother, just shoot me in the head and get it over with because I'm in trouble. Oh, no, it's bullshit. His family doesn't believe it. The citizens of Baltimore don't believe it. The only people believe it are, are the people in law enforcement. So, you know, yeah. he was definitely slaughtered by his own. So I mean, it's just crazy to have somebody killed in broad daylight with witnesses and then months later, or even about a year later, it was close to a year later that they came out and said that, yes. um, hey, you know, turns out 
that it was a suicide. It's just bonkers. Originally, the cops thought it was a gang hitter from another state uh, because this was not too long after the Dallas thing and some areas in the uh, southern United States where in the western United States where gang members had actually called in hits on cops. And there was also the memory amongst the police of what happened in Washington, D.C. in the mid-90s. One year, five cops were killed on duty by guys that essentially ambushed them and, and, and executed them. So one of them was, and one of them that wasn't killed was attacked with rebar. And actually, Fred, he's, he's got like 200,000 readers. His name's Fred. He used to be, uh, Fred Reed. Fred he used Reed, to be yeah. Order for the Washington Times on the crime beat. And he was there when one of these guys got attacked by, by some dude that had a piece of rebar. So the cops in this area suspected that it would be an out of town criminal coming in to uh, make a hit for Crip 52 which is a gang that runs that neighborhood because they were investigating a murder there. Uh, Suter's family and the other people in the city didn't think so. They thought it was a BPD cop, a dirty cop that killed him because Suter was supposed to testify the very next day against all of those, against all of those crooked cops. Seven of those guys went Jenkins. up. A couple more of, them, more of them have gone up. Now I had one Baltimore city cop who quit the force. What he told me that, that I talked to, he told me that there's a woman, that there's a crooked female cop that actually was supervising the guy that, that got burned uh, for supervising the other seven crooked cops. Okay, so what he told me is they only got the soldiers and the sergeant. They didn't get the lieutenant or the captain or the major, that this, that this hierarchy of corruption went all the way up, and basically they just took out from the sergeant down. So uh, the... The regular citizens in Baltimore have suspected that it was a cop either from here or from some other municipality that was brought in to murder Souter because he was going to testify at trial and they weren't sure what he was going to say. Yeah, we're just making wild speculation. This is not <laughs> for informational purposes. This is an entertainment <laughs> podcast. But let me ask you, what is the level of policing in Baltimore? Is it rock bottom? Like, do the cops... Because you're describing an environment where you, I just can't imagine cops trying to do their job. So is, is it rock bottom or does it have more to go? It can get worse, but I can tell you I talked to uh, Nikki, who's this pretty young thing, weighs about 105 pounds, goes to work in high heels. She got chased down the street, okay, to a parking garage that she was going to by two Mexicans. Mr. Muhammad was off duty. He wasn't there to protect her. That's the guy. That's the homeless black dude that got put on trial for murder for beating to death one of the three Mexicans that tried to kill him one night. Okay, but he got off and he's back on duty. But he wasn't on duty then. The cops did nothing. These dudes chased her right by cops. The guy that protected her, was, and this is the central precinct at Baltimore Street. The guy that protected her was the Middle Eastern guy that was working as the the parking garage attendant. Did like a counterattack against these two watermelon head Mexican guys and charged down uh, the ramp at them and they ran away. And even Yolanda Bonet, who was a girl that previously protected Nikki from uh, a couple of vagrants of her own race uh, down there. She sometimes carries a 25 auto, sometimes mace, sometimes both. And she's this very brash queen. And when Nikki told her what happened, she told her that two black dudes had just chased her down Baltimore Street on her way back from lunch. That she had to kick, she had to kick off her heels and run. She didn't have her gun on her, so she had to run. That this is within 75 yards of the largest police station in Baltimore City. Okay, and drug deals are done within 10 feet of cops. Now, this is like the rule that drug dealers use at night, because the only safe place to do a drug deal down there at night is when the cops have their back turned to you and they're like five or 10 feet away, because they figure nobody's going to come up, pull out a gun, and start popping when. The, you know, you got five cops right there. All right. But yet the like, cops are uh, not going to get interfere with your transaction either. But the uh, the number one priority of the Baltimore City Police Department, as uh, assigned by uh, the mayor, is to investigate itself. The number two priority is to buy back guns. Uh, <laughs> oh, did you see that someone had a rocket launcher? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And just tally, and tally the crimes and downgrade the crimes, right? 
I mean, that's, yes. they'll come show up after the fact and write minimize the uh, the report writing the, needed. The third tier seems to have switched from drug enforcement to going against uh, specific crimes. That they want to prosecute gun crimes, so now gun violence is regarded as different than violence in Baltimore. So stabbings and stuff. They haven't even interviewed anybody about this woman getting stabbed to death on on Thanksgiving night. Okay, so nobody's been arrested, nobody's talking or anything. The way to kill somebody and get away from it with it in Baltimore for sure is to stab them, because there's some kind of federal incentive here to just do something about gun crimes, and it also seems to dovetail with some kind of leftist agenda with. Uh, you know, anti-gun ownership. Yeah. They're big on that. And the other thing is um, a federal prosecutor has been assigned to prosecute, prosecute fentanyl cases. And our uh, ghetto girl state's attorney, I saw her speak on this, and she stuck her thumb up at this guy and let everybody know if they're going to sell fentanyl in Baltimore, they're going to have to deal with somebody who actually knows how to put a legal case together. <laughs> so... Uh, I'm glad I don't live there anymore. I just visit. Uh, just skirting around the outsides of it, the, the outskirts of it, is bad enough. I walk through a playground next to the rec center where I used to box and find uh, shell casings on the ground and, and find out that a local father was stuck up at 1.30 in the afternoon while pushing his daughter on the swing set by three goons. He got out of a car with guns, you know. This And this kind of stuff doesn't get reported. That did not make the newspaper or a single news station. That was a social media report. That one of the only things that Facebook is any good for is reporting on local crime. And that's not used. That's not being sourced anymore. Uh, Everything is coming straight from the police to the news stations as far as what crime is being reported. For a couple of years, they were using that as a resource, but they've stopped. It's so important to try to understand something locally. Like, you know, we have these... I'm thinking about Nate Silver, who does the 538 website, and he's all all about analyzing the, the numbers. But these guys just take the the numbers at face value, you know, <laughs> they, and they have no idea what what is actually going on in places like Baltimore. And I and I freely admit that Baltimore is, might be, you know, it's one of might be the very worst in the country. Yeah, and it's, well, the thing is, as things get worse in other places, the same thing's going to happen. All right. The numbers are going to be adjusted down. So that's why I didn't complain too much about uh, the murder ball. It still means cities between 500,000, uh, cities over 500,000, Baltimore is by far the most dangerous place. Detroit's like 60 kills away uh, from Baltimore. Okay. That, that's how bad it is, but the most vicious cities are the ones that are that are even smaller. St. Louis is consistently posted more kills per per person than Baltimore has. Uh, and then you go farther down than that to the even smaller cities like Flint, Capitol Heights, Maryland. And, and it just gets worse the smaller that they, <laughs> the smaller that these places get. And at the same time you see that there's a huge uptick in crime outside of Baltimore and Detroit in the surrounding uh, suburban municipalities. So at the same time, the crime is being suppressed. The numbers are being suppressed and lied about in the main municipality. That municipality is doing what it can to push that crime outward. That's actually in cooperation with criminal elements who want pressure fields to go harvest. So you do definitely have the criminals and the city administrations and police forces are working together in terms of encouraging the spread of violent crime to surrounding uh, suburbs. You know, that's definitely ongoing around the country and different things. You mentioned also that the number of vacant homes in Baltimore is being severely understated. Yes. How do how are they doing that? They're sticking with a number that the Baltimore Housing Authority used in two thousand and one, which was uh, twenty thousand vacants. Private surveys have indicated up to 46,000 vacants. The housing inspectors who I interviewed in 2003 and 2004 told me at that point it was 25,000 vacants. And it, it's probably something like unemployment. The housing inspectors I interviewed told me that Baltimore City only has the capacity to board up two vacant houses a day. Okay, And only then, once it gets boarded up, is it then considered a vacant house. So with four guys and two vans, you can't have any more than what? 700, you can only add like 700 vacant houses a year to the official tally because you can only board up two of them a day. 
So it takes two guys a whole day to properly board up one of these houses. It could be as simple as that. It's like the unemployment right. numbers. Once you get kicked off the unemployment rolls, once you've been chronically unemployed and can no longer collect unemployment, you're magically now no longer unemployed, even though you're still unemployed. So it might not even be anything, anything dishonest. It's probably just lazy bureaucracy. They don't have anybody right. to go out and actually make a survey. The other thing is the population figures for Baltimore City are still including people who who own homes or who used to rent homes in Baltimore and and either have left that property go fallow as an owner and they've left it or they have they have just absconded without paying the rent if they were a renter. So all these people still supposedly live in Baltimore City. So we're going to get another count of Baltimore City residents that's going to show the total of being over 600,000 when it's clearly under 600,000. It's probably around 585 right now. And last year, I think the total was given was like 610. And you can see a discrepancy in the misreporting of the number of vacant houses. So one private one private relief agency came up with 46,000. That's probably an overestimate. It's probably, that figure is probably including double counted houses and houses that are, that are no longer vacant because they're no longer standing because the Baltimore City Fire Department's gone out and burned them down wow. so that they can, so some real estate guys can get in there and start gentrifying. All right. Okay, so who knows what it is? My best guess is there's probably 30,000 uh, standing vacant in Baltimore City right now. So it's somewhere between 20 and 46. So I'm just kind of <laughs> picking it in the middle. We have a kind of a serious topic to cover. All right. I, cool? I'll give you a quick Twitter update. Here's what I wrote to John Random. I said, I can't believe I forgot about this one. And he wrote, here's his response. LOL. Good Lord. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> But I think the boys in the lab can meme it. So. <laughs> this is a picture from, I think they hit you with a, someone hit you with a, was it a flail that made this huge bruise on your tricep? That's a three-layer bruise. You can see it ends in a perfect line where my elbow pad was. That was with a flail that was made with chains attached to a stick. And wired to the chains were three wiffle balls filled with pennies, okay, and then taped with duct tape. And uh, before he hit me with that, I had taken a hit on the tricep because he was a left-hander with a duct tape shinai, which is a kendo stick. We found it break easily, so we tried to make them unbreakable by taping them up, and they held up pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> an, an octagon-shaped stick, you know. So I'll put these, this picture up on the YouTube video. This Twitter exchange has to do with with uh, perfume. There's some... <laughs> there's some the toxic on, masculinity. Yeah. There's Man. this person, a new, a new Twitter friend that I have who advocates fragrances, who's a, a connoisseur of perfumes. And John Random, who is a friend of the podcast, is there too. He's also friends with this guy and so <laughs> so I mentioned your idea of the toxic masculinity perfume or cologne and so he's working on marketing materials thanks John Random that's, that's great thanks so I will be uh, <laughs> this is James, no. <laughs> James LaFon's toxic a masculine fragrance for men hey, <laughs> it's not just going to be me, you know, in 10 days, uh, I'm going to start training with Tony Cox out there on the West Coast. And first order of business is going to be to get that five gallon bucket to put whiskey in. And we could use that to soak our uh, boxing wraps and <laughs> feeders and dock straps. And, uh, should we do the socks? Uh, I'm sorry. I, no, I can't no, comment. I was, I can't get on board with that. Right. That's too much. Okay. I but the point is though. Uh, oh, I wanted to say if uh, you see this picture and you want to know more, then the book that you want is Winter of a Fighting Life because this is a, a photo from that book, Winter of a Fighting Life. 
It's the uh, chronicles and catalogs of your many multitude of in injuries, which you could probably write another volume of that by now. Well, but if you hate me, uh, then you definitely want to buy that book. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's, right there. it's the punishment, it, it, all the punishment you've endured. Yeah. If you're one of those 1,000 Facebook likes that decided you didn't like me so I could get down to 134 likes, then you want to buy whatever fighting life because it's all about me deservedly getting my ass kicked. Okay. <laughs> you think you've gained and lost a thousand likes over the years on Facebook? I've noticed that every time I'd go up four, I'd go down one. So now it's a, as a that would be an over exaggeration. So now that we're at 140, that probably means that about 600 people at one point thought that I deserved a thumbs up, and only 134 stuck with that. <laughs> All right. Well, your your Twitter About, account had over 300 followers, but we nuked that one. And now the one I still use has 187 followers, for whatever it's worth. It felt kind of good getting rid of the Twitter account. It was kind of like being a World War II hero and calling an artillery on yourself at the end of the movie. So. <laughs> yeah. Give the uh, coordinates and say your prayers. Well, it's... <laughs> so a friend sent by email. What are we gonna calling this guy? Vlad. Vlad Tepid. Vlad mm -hmm. Tepid. Vlad Tepid. He emailed a couple weeks ago, and he came up with a hard question that I will allow you to answer in its entirety. Human mortality. Would it be possible to make to make human mortality one of the themes? I'd be interested to hear some of the following, the historical views on mortality within the context of both heroism, as well as every man's life, ancient Greece, Rome, Norsemen, Ragnarok, and on and on. Uh, next, dignity and old age. Some cultures revere their elders, some brush them aside in contempt. For those of us living in the latter, how do we preserve at least a shred of it in our advanced years? And the crackpot's own view on mortality and the way to exit in the face of the current longer is better attitude. I think he's talking about life extension. Everybody wants to live as long as possible, even though the usable time is greatly reduced for those of us with failing health. You have the floor. I had a the start at the end. I had a close friend who worked as a, uh, you know, doing like x-rays and CAT scans and stuff. I don't know what you call it. And he found himself being a billing vector for these, uh, these medical companies where, you know, 101 year women were being dragged into this magnetic tunnel on their deathbed just to generate. And it would get to the point when these people were at the end of their life, the business or organism of uh, the medical establishment just tries to generate as much billing on them as possible. And I had a lady friend whose mother actually fought this while she was on her deathbed. Uh, she would, uh, doctors would come in to sign her chart. Who, she didn't even know these doctors. It was just a way of attaching a bill to this woman. And she would uh, call them on it. And she hired an assistant to protect her against the success of billing. I mean, so, so yeah, we're the whole, the whole fate of the, uh, being in the hands of this medical establishment after the point where we can't really do what we would like to do anymore. That's pretty grim indeed. And uh, I'm not looking forward to having any such life. As far as uh, maintaining my dignity as I wheeze across the world, you know, I just try to help out younger people and do in writing uh, what I can do to uh, fight the world that was designed to eat my soul. That's, uh, that's it. As far as uh, trying to maintain my dignity, um, my, my books, you know, whenever I go, I'm going to have books that haven't been published yet that are still going to be coming out. So in a way, I'll still be around. I think of myself as laying truth landmines in the, uh, in the whole lie matrix. So that's how I'm doing it myself. Uh, and from the day to day, it just makes you feel good to be able to help somebody that's still got a chance of doing something productive and uh, maybe having a better life. So uh, I pretty much go those two routes, just my writing and, and helping younger people. The ancient idea of mortality is it's something that I've been working on. You know, it all everywhere around the world it starts out with animism, which is the, the generalized 
notion that people are part of nature, they come from nature, and they go back into nature. And this idea has kind of never left humanity. It's buried. It becomes witchcraft and occultism under the heel of some religions. It gets absorbed by some religions. Uh, the uh, basic idea about what happens with your with your relatives when they die in these types of settings is that they become absorbed in the natural world and you're still part of the natural world because you as you haven't gotten to the point yet where you're civilized and people were taught in civilization to see themselves as avatars of some greater supernatural power that comes from outside the world. So primitive people actually think that they're from the world, part of the world, and going back into the world. And this includes the heavens. And you get to split later on with different types of religions uh, as to the idea of significant ancestors being able to lodge somewhere in the heavens instead of maybe just uh, inhabiting the forest and being able to help you here. Just the idea that there's some positive energy from them that might help you ends up becoming, once you have nomadic cultures that are based on controlling animals instead of following animals, you've now domesticated the animals, but you're not living in a city yet, and you're generally not in wooded territories and you're out in open pasture land, the sky becomes a bigger thing. And you end up with a conflation of this idea of the ancestor becoming going back into nature and then the power that the sky has. If you've been in an area where there's not a lot of terrain to interfere with the weather and you can experience a 60 percent temperature change in 10 minutes or a big storm comes out of nowhere, you get the idea of uh, the ancestral sky, dot, sky god might make some sense to modern people in that way. And at the same time that this is happening, you have agrarian civilizations developing in river valleys where you have priesthoods managing Mother Earth cults that would, uh, in a lot of aspects, would probably make people think of a lot of the feminism that's going on today. And you have a large slave society uh, growing grain and living a pretty malnourished life, but able to develop surpluses for the elite so the elite doesn't have to work. And this is where you'll usually get seated earth cults. Uh, most of our revealed religions are a combination. The, the basis is for them are a combination of these seated earth cults where you have usually the sun or the sun is a sacrifice. There's the earth mother and then the sun is a sacrifice. And you can uh, read uh, Osiris and Isis and then, the, uh, and then the myth of Persephone are two things that touch on this. Of course, this unhappy little matrix where all the women have arthritis in their knees by the age of 30 from grinding grain and all the men have hernias and broken backs from uh, from heavy farming. This order gets conquered by the nomads. These people can never defend themselves against the nomads. They're also incapable of opposing their will on the majority of people who still live a natural way of life in forested areas or or mountainous areas or swamps. Once the nomads conquer the river valleys, then they actually have the surplus to continue their nomad ways uh, without pasture. They could then go into forested and mountainous areas and work on imposing their will on the people who still hold animistic beliefs. So in ancient religions, you have these layers, the animistic beliefs that the countryside people will still hold to. This could be reflected in the goddess Artemis. Then you'll have the seeded earth beliefs. Lots of times, this is accommodated uh, two ways, by having a descendant female deity, like the wife of Hades or the queen of the underworld in the Sumerian myth. And then you also have uh, fertility goddesses that will become the wives and daughters of the sky gods that the nomads bring in, like Zeus and Hera. So eventually you end up with a fourth level of dealing with the afterlife, and that's uh, with philosophy and the mystery religions. And they're two different things, but they happen concurrently. Christianity really emerged when philosophy and mystery religions were starting to be overburdened with people with less intellect than these practices require, looking to them as a, a place to go beyond uh, the civic power religion and their, the simple religion of the countryside. In mystery religions, it's not, it's, it's hard to determine where the philosophers were going in a lot of different ways, like people are now. There was people trying to figure it out. But what was going on with the mystery religions 
is methods that were used by animistic people for vision quests, that like a coming of age thing for a young man to try to find his purpose in life. Uh, these types of rituals, sometimes involving drugs or different trance-inducing practices, would be conducted under the supervision of uh, the acolytes of these cults in a kind of blind practice session for negotiating the afterlife. Because these people didn't know what was going to come after death, and there were a lot of myths floating around, so they tried to d psychologically develop the person so that they could survive whatever they might face. So they're going to have to get past a crocodile that's going to eat people with heavy hearts, or they're going to have to deal with Achilles still stuck, you know, between the river sticks and, 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 and the golden isles, or what's going to happen. That's not something that's going to give people a lot of confidence. Yeah, there's only a certain amount of people that are going to go through this. So you, with the revealed religions, what you get is a blueprint that makes it pretty simple for everybody. Your specific actions uh, here will give you a specific predetermined fate in the hereafter. So the wealthy aristocrat can whore and murder his entire life. And on his deathbed, he can give his money to the church and he can accept Jesus in his heart and he can go to heaven. And people who aren't wealthy aristocrats, well, they're going to have to behave and toil and suffer. And that toil and suffering and recognizing Jesus as their Savior, that's going to get them into heaven. and They're going to enjoy this internal life. And if not, you get to enjoy one of the many supposed fates of the pagan religions, which is developed. Uh, one good example of a re revealed religion using an animistic aspect uh, would be Moses on the mountain. Another one would be Muhammad in his cave. Uh, they, I mean, these are very animistic things. These are very ancient practices that were going on for a long while where somebody would go to a mountain or a cave, do their meditations. Had to be somebody already had some status. And then they would come back and uh, try to inspire the people. So the revealed religions kind of harken all the way back to the animistic. And at the same time, borrow elements of the civic religions that's going to make it a, appeal to the power structure. So the government will support this religion. Uh, these types of religions do not thrive in the absence of government support, as we can see when looking at the Muslim world and the post-Christian world. In the absence of government support, these religions really dwindle quickly because they're, uh, they're highly civic in nature. As far as the, uh, the heroic element, and, and something I know nothing about is Ragnarok. Okay. I'm not a big Norse mythology person. Uh, most of my reading is on the, the Middle East and, and the uh, Greek tradition. The, uh, types of heroes that, uh, appealed to the Greeks were usually extraordinary heroes. Every culture has heroes. The hero, uh, the, the root of the word hero comes from protector. And that's what it means in most cultures, a protector, a champion, somebody that goes out and fights for your group. Uh, but in practice in the Greek world for over a thousand years, a hero was somebody that did more than that. He would protect his very specific tribal group and maintain the original idea of the hero. But then he would go against the greater organizations of men. He would go against kings and he would go against the gods. And some heroes actually became deities and became more important. And amongst the Romans, uh, amongst the Hellenized Romans, Hercules became more important than, than Apollo, for instance. And Apollo was the key god, actually a rival of, of Heracles in, in the Greek myths. The Greek idea generally has people who either fight against the gods and they're doomed or they're, or they outwit the gods. Like, so that's Achilles and Odysseus right there. And this goes all the way back to the earlier Indo European tradition, which is shown with Gilgamesh and Enkidu going against the gods. One of them transcends it. One of them is doomed by it. The Roman idea was more civic. The Roman idea of the hero was that the hero was elevated to a type of sainthood. And was remembered because he fought for his civilization and his God at the same time. So Horatio at the bridge, uh, now to Roland, Arthur, and Joan of Arc would probably be the last one. And Joan of Arc gives you the idea of where this type of heroism goes. It's totally co-opted by the system. She was simply a sacrificial avatar for a king that couldn't even save her uh, from his enemies. So... 
at that point, you just get down to the disposable military hero and he gets ground up and he at least gets a footnote or maybe even a book. So the, the idea of heroism, as far as going against the gods and against the system, would probably today most apply to people who uh, are dissident thinkers. And it's one reason why uh, Tyson Fury became so popular as a boxer who's not a crowd-pleasing fighter. He, he usually wins stinkers because he just makes the other guy miss. But he actually came out and spoke up for his people against the government. And for many of our people, since we're in a post-Christian era now, and the, the Christian notion of the hero was inherited directly from Rome. Okay, it was the civic hero that becomes the crusader and the conquistador, the person that's fighting for the system and the God unified. But now that you've got, now that the system has become God and you still have people that claim the older ideas or new ideas, then more likely you're going to see somebody heroized that just speaks up against the system and uh, somehow doesn't get crushed by it. I want to draw a distinction between life extension the, which is sort of a materialistic interpretation compared to immortality through heroic deeds. So what you have today, what you have today is people who are quite obsessed with medical treatments or drugs or even strange habits like uh, starvation is known to extend life to, to some extent in, um, in animals. So there are people out there who actually eat the very minimal, it's kind of like an anorexia, but if you really control your calories and actually live this miserable life. That like, where you're, like, a, like an ancient Indian, Indian yogi. Yeah, like you're cold all the time and and depressed and no libido and stuff like that. But hey, you're going to live maybe longer. So the, we have this weird obsession with life extension and health maximization it's not wrong to want to be healthy and then also this type of digital immortality that some people believe that you'll be able to get your all your mind and memories into the computer somehow compared to somebody in ancient times who would have sought immortality through acts of heroism you know that's i i feel like it's just a full material degradation of the concept that's interesting. I think that what we're going to end up with is the same thing we had in the ancient world where it's going to split or your idea of, you know, you're going to have people that uh, that are searching for this that have no idea of achieving it for themselves, They're just out of their curiosity, the tiny amount of philosophically minded people. As far as the life extension goes, searching for that, uh, that, uh, that clawing for, you know, for every breath. I think that really comes from from the atheistic construct of our civilization because really this civilization is our god. This is what it is. If you're if you're a Christian or a Muslim or something, you're a heretic when it comes to the point of view of this civilization. I mean, yeah, they'll use their Christian Zionists to fight their wars and stuff like that, but this civilization is for itself and it's a way of keeping the most people breathing for the longest period of time at the same time. And this means that if you totally buy into it, if you're a liberal person, whether you're uh, everybody in this country is a liberal, except for maybe about a hundred people, I think if you're a liberal person, whatever party, whether you're left or right or democratic or Republican, if you buy into this, then just staying alive, the longer you stay alive, the longer you're part of God, because this is what's sacred. It all it comes down to is how can we keep, the lowest quality of life going the longest. That's what it's about. So uh, I, I see that clinging to life there. On the other hand, you are going to see on the tech end, you're going to see people like this, uh, this fiend Bezos. Is that, yeah. is that what his name is? Okay. Actually try to construct themselves as a deity and try to upload their consciousness into some kind of device and get it into a worldwide network. And these same people are, go are going to be the only people that are going to demonstrate a consistent desire to expand human habitation and actually own planets. You're going to see guys trying to put their names on a planet or a moon or an asteroid or something and actually own it as their feast. And everybody there is going to be worshiping their mind through the computer system that they're going to be housed in. This is the what I mean, the, this is probably the only thing that science fiction writers have consistently predicted over the years that looks like it's going to happen 
and happen a lot sooner than anybody thought. This whole thing about uh, the, the transhumanism, I guess, is, is where that comes in here. I guess that's a type of immortality if you can do that. And then there's a type of immortality that relies on other people to, to actually expend energy to propagate your memory. Well, so that's heroic. And then the other kind would be a hierarchical. And, and the hero was always against the hierarchy when, except when he served it. And when he served it, he would, uh, you know, he would get the minimal, he would get the minimal immortality of being remembered. And that's it. So I, as far as, uh, trying to linger on, I, I just, uh, I'm somebody in bad health myself. I trashed my lungs uh, working in freezers and refrigerated it. The 20 below like dries out your lungs, and then when you go over and work in the dairy case, these all hold mold in them. So if I don't constantly take like expectorants, you know, I'll pretty much just end up with brown goo for lungs after a while. I'm fighting that off as long as I can uh, to finish writing all my books. You know, but I would have uh, no desire to get like to get my lungs scrubbed or to get new lungs or get hooked up to a machine or something like that get to continue to continue uh, breathing other people. There. <laughs> so I have no desire for, uh, for any heroic measures to extend the viability of my carcass. You know, personally, that's how I feel about it. Yeah, I have uh, had occasion to see some family members at end of life and um yeah, it makes you think about what you, how much you really want at that stage too. So I want to close out on a more lighthearted note. Um, yesterday was March. Uh, sorry, yesterday was January first, two thousand nineteen, and Brazil inaugurated their new president. I don't know how to say his his first name, so it's President Bolsonaro. He uh, had some really choice quotes here. He said that uh, allowing good people to own guns discourages criminals and will reduce the homicide rate. He said that we're going to fight the Marxist trash in the, educa <laughs> in the education <laughs> uh, establishments. And he said that he held up Brazil's flag, which is green and yellow. And he said this flag will never be red, referring to communism this flag will never be red unless it's because we are fighting, you know, we're bleeding on it in the fight for our country. Wow. Wow. Did, did, uh, did the American God Emperor have anything interesting to say? He said, yes, year? he gave, well, he, he gave Bolsonaro a congratulatory tr tweet in response to that. And he said that the U S is with you. U S is with you. So that was nice, and uh, so they made friends on Twitter. I don't know if they are following each other, but they did make friends. And then, yeah, he, uh, he's he been busy. Trump has been really busy on Twitter, <laughs> but his New Year's greeting was all in capitals. Happy New Year to everyone, including the haters and the fake news media. 2019 will be a fantastic year for those not suffering from Trump derangement syndrome. Just calm down and enjoy the ride. Great things are happening for our country. <laughs> so this guy's actually paying attention to his weight. He's, he's, he's such a gamer that he's, he's studied uh, himself as a social wrecking ball. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he's I mean he's so just he's laughing. He's yeah. He's just saying that because he knows that it enrages <laughs> it's just enraging to people to read that. It makes me laugh. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, it is funny. Oh, do you know who Alexandria Ocasio Cortez is? I saw her when I was staying in New Jersey uh, at the strip club. Uh, I did see one of her ads. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, she's, uh, a big, she's, she's a big She's a big Apparently going to be our president at some point. <laughs> yeah, that's what they say. <laughs> and The double-digit IQ population is continuing to be increased at the maximum in this country, and they should have their president. You should have a double-digit IQ president. <laughs> represent the, the people that are going to be the new Americans. So this, yeah. uh, 
as far as our last discussion on mortality, I'm really going to try to hang around for the next three years, okay? <laughs> because I hate this. Uh, I hate this world. It's my enemy. It was designed to eat me. And every little thorn I can stick into it, and every time I can see it quiver in pain, that that'll they'll send me to the grave with some joy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know? In white, my chest. Yes, here's another <laughs> one for you. In white Indian news, Elizabeth Warren has uh, declared her candidacy for president for 2020. You know what? Maybe she could get herself put on for part of the promotion. Maybe Land Lake's butter would allow her to get on the label, you know, spreading <laughs> out the cornucopia. I, I mean, it's it's a pros, it's yeah. a prosper. Gospel on a, on a sexy label. What can I say? <laughs> it's one of my favorite babes. It's still the Land of Lakes chick. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think Beto, do you know who Beto O'Rourke is? I think he counts as a white Indian, too. He's an Irish guy who pretends to be Hispanic. He has his little Hispanic nickname, Beto, like Roberto or Beto. I don't know. It's supposed to be his nickname. But he's also a contender for 2020. But he's all another white Indian. If you if you want to go towards the uh, Hispanic end of the Native American analysis, is there is there any idea whether or not the Mother of America will run for uh, for president? You're not, you yeah. don't mean uh, she's from Baltimore, baby. Oh, 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 I don't think she will. No, I, I think she likes the oh. life of ease and. Uh, she likes the so, weather in, in Santa Barbara where she lives. and So she'll possibly just be anointing. Perhaps. I, I, think she's, I think she's past her peak of influence. Maybe that's just my me and my bubble, but I, ne I never think about her. She's not in well, my... Well, she recommended the crab cakes at Papa's Restaurant in Parkville, Maryland because she visited there and she had her crab cakes. Mm -hmm. And a month after she recommended their crab cakes, the owner got robbed and pistol whipped for the first time. That's how much influence she has. Wow. Like, she can go into like a suburban ghost diner setting and on national TV, she can, on her own network and everything, she can declare that these are the best crab cakes in Maryland. And within 30 days, the 85 year old Greek that owns the place <laughs> is getting pistol whipped by some homeboy. Okay. So wow. That's, that's like a Midas what, touch. <laughs> Oh man, I I was thinking about Hillary. I it's a good chance I think that she'll throw throw it in again, which would make me really happy. I That'd be great. Really... You know, Trump will never, if they have a debate, Trump might just try to trigger her into a stroke or something. I don't say. <laughs> Look like Merlin. <laughs> <laughs> so no. maybe, maybe we'll tease this because I wanted to talk about this. So maybe we'll tease this for the next time we tape. But I wanted to do talk about a comparison contrast with all of these women in power and compare to some historical examples of women in power. So I think we sure. could talk about that next time. Sure. That's my biggest, longest uh, standing history project is that one about uh, the female influence in war. Mm -hmm. So sure, I would be glad to flex my misogyny muscle. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You always are. All right. Well, I think that's a good one. <laughs> and thank you, Vlad Tepid. I'm going to finish writing the article that answers his question in a little bit more detail. All right. And post it sometime in the next couple of weeks. Very good. Okay. Thanks a lot. That was the Crackpot Podcast with James LaFond and Lynn Lockhart. Thanks, guys. What do you want? There is no more. If you find a place, please let me know. Take me with you when you go. Take me with you when you go. Take me with you when you go. Take me with you when you go.